I briefly want to introduce you to an idea, though, that I think some of you will like and some of you will hate. I find more and more students like it. But it's a really simple programming language on here. And what I like programming for is because this process is easy if you have to do four or five rectangles. Um, but the problem is you get really terrible over area with four or five rectangles. If we can explain to the calculator how to do that. So if you have a calculator, you're welcome to, to kind of follow along. I haven't prepared this program ahead of time. Um, if we're going to create a program, what we're going to do, I, I'm not a good programmer, first of all. I had one Fortran programming course in about 1986. So the first thing you have to do here is create a new program. And so I'm going to scroll over and click on New. And I'm going to give it a name. It comes up with the alphabet prompt. And so you have the green on my keyboard, the green alphabet letters. Um, and the whole alphabet should be there. I'm going to be wanting to get areas, so I'm just going to give this a very descriptive name, like area, because they told me to give programs names that remind you of what it is that they're supposed to do. So at the end of the semester, when you've got 80 programs you've written, you have some idea what they do. It's probably a good idea to put a little bit of thought into the process we're trying to model. If we're going to compute an area, like on the one we just did, we'd like to be able to tell it what the left and right hand endpoints are. Because one of the first things we have to do is take the left endpoint, the right endpoint, subtract them, and then we want to know how many pieces we want, and we have to do that division. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is figure out what my delta x has to be, my common interval width. And since I can't use the letters delta and x on here, I'm going to give it a suggestive letter like w. And so for finding my, my width, um, I need the, the program to ask you some information. So when I click the program button, there's two types of commands that I wind up using a lot. The control commands that control the program flow and the input output commands. So if I scroll over to input output, the one I use the most is prompt. And what happens is, if you want it to prompt you for something like the left-hand endpoint, what would be a good name for the left-hand endpoint? Of course, I almost always talk about the interval from A to B. So because that's what I almost always do, it's not necessarily the right thing. It's just something that's consistent with what we do. I'm going to have it prompt for A. And when we run the program, I then want it to prompt for B. So that's option two. And then I want it to prompt for how many subintervals. So that's the three pieces I need to compute the interval with, is left and right endpoint and the number of subintervals. So another prompt command. There's probably a way to prompt all three of them at the same time, but I'm not a very good programmer. So, and I almost always will follow the book on this. The number of subintervals is going to almost always be the letter N. So that makes it easy to remember what the thing is doing. And I want to have it take those numbers and compute the interval width. And so to do that, well, we, we saw how we did that. We took the right-hand endpoint. We subtracted the left-hand endpoint. We divided that by the number of pieces we wanted. And now there's a button down here, right to the left and just down from the number four. It's right under the natural logarithm button. That's the store button. That's how you store something to a memory location. I'm going to store my interval width to W, because it's a letter that will remind me of width. And the way we computed our rectangle areas was we took a point on the interval, and we plugged it into the function. And we got a height, and then we multiply it by W. And then we did the same thing again, and the same thing again, and the same thing again. And the structure that you use to do that, these kind of repeated, repetitive things, or the one that I use the most, is a for loop. What a for loop does is it takes an index, and starts it at some value, and goes up to some, some starting value up to some ending value, and it repeats whatever is in the next list of commands 
until it gets to the ending value. So I want to have a letter, and I'm going to use the letter K because that's consistent with what the book uses in this chapter. I want K, comma, going from 1, comma, up to whatever the number of rectangles is. And how did I get the letter Y there? I probably get the alpha command. For K going from 1 up to N. So now we've got to think a little bit about what we wanted to do. Let's think about what we did. As we built these, looking at the specific examples over here, with the first rectangle, we computed the height, we multiplied it by the width, and got an area. And then we computed the height of the next one, multiplied it by the width, and got an area. And we waited until the end to add all of them up. The problem with doing that, if you want to do a lot of rectangles, is it's very memory inefficient. I have to have it, if I'm doing a 500 rectangles, I have to have it record a list of those 500 areas and then add them up. It's actually a more efficient programming thing to build a cumulative sum. To take the first one and dump it into something like the letter S. So I'll take the first area and put it into S. And then I'll compute the next time around the second area, add it to the current value of S, and throw that into S. If I want to use that same structure, then if I start out by putting 0 into S, then I can say, I know the value it starts with, let's add the area of the first rect rectangle to 0 and make that the new value of S. Go into the next iteration, compute the area of the second rectangle, add that to the cumulative sum, and make that the new value of the sum. And then for the third one, add that to the total accumulated area and update the area. And keep doing that until you get to rectangle number n, add it to the sum of the first n minus 1 rectangles, and make that the final sum. And then you're at the end of that loop, and then you will have computed the area. In hindsight, what I need to do is go up here before I get into that loop, be right here at the beginning of this line, hit second insert, a good programmer would have planned ahead, but again, I'm not a good programmer. I want to store the value 0 into S, and I think the fancy computer term for that is I'm initializing the variable. <coughs> so how did I compute the area of the first rectangle? I took the value of the function at some point. Let's just agree on a point. Let's agree on the right-hand endpoint. The right-hand endpoint, I had to figure out a formula for this. So that came up at some point. So I wrote down whatever our left-hand endpoint was, that's A. The first value, x1, the right-hand endpoint of the first interval, is going to be A plus W. And then the next one, the right-hand endpoint, is going to be A plus 2W, and then A plus 3W, and A plus 4W, up until A plus NW. So, for each rectangle, what I want to do is take whatever function I stick into y1. So to do that, I pick variables, y variables, I pick the function y1, and I want to evaluate that, so y1 of a alpha, there's the letter a, plus alpha k times w, because the right-hand endpoint of rectangle k was the left-hand endpoint of the interval plus k times k copies of the width. So that gives me the function evaluated at the right-hand endpoint, and I want to multiply that by the width of the interval. I want to add that to whatever value is currently in my accumulated sum and then store that value into my accumulated sum. I forgot to hit enter and finish that line of code. So now I want to go through and end that particular 
process that particular loop. And then what I'd like it to do is actually just show me or print the value of S. So if I just put the letter S there, that'll end the program. 